welcome back to the Independent Investor Channel for the weekly discussion on Hylion. I do not miss these. I do not miss these for the world. And the message is way too important uh, to continually and um, um, uh, update the progress on this company is super important. Uh, we just came out of the Q2 call. And as we enter into this uh, Q3 quarter, I go back to some of the fundamentals that I have um, expressed upon over the course of owning this company, being as new as it is to, uh, to public markets um, and trying to penetrate an industry here that has been um, nothing short of, of remarkable and difficult at the same time. Uh, and I always want to continue to foot stomp what it is that we know, um, where it is that we think we are going. Uh, some of the headwinds that I stink, think are still out there, um, are they over, overcomeable? Uh, is Hylion going to be able to navigate this landscape that they've entered into? Um, stakes are high for Hylion, um, and, and so is the uh, tactical uh, maneuvering that is going to be required of Hylion and the leadership team to actually see this thing to fruition. Um, I do contend that we are still in a bridging phase. I've said that now for months. So <clears throat> for, for you guys that uh, had your reaction on the Q2 call, uh, again, I think my, I was disappointed in some areas. Uh, I was, um, I was actually relieved in some, some categories uh, I was also left confused in some other categories, especially when we got to the Q&A portion um, of, of the, the call. And then you digress and you ask yourself, does one quarter make a company? And, and the answer is, is no, it doesn't, especially for a company like this, that if in all fairness, you look back and look at the progress that's been had um, from this company, had it gone public now, with the 2,000 reservations and the 200, uh, you know, ERX orders backed by deposits, the company would be at $50 a, a share. I sure as hell wouldn't be below 10, wouldn't be below its IPO price. Um, but I, I think the nature by which this company went public um, and some of the initial hype on the onset that has died off now, um, and we're left looking at uh, a company that... Um, has some real positives to it and it's got some real headwinds and I'm going to look to readdress um, some of those items that I identify with the company as being uh, extremely positive. None of that's gone away uh, as this uh, company looks to um, step into what what is setting up to be a very, very interesting 2023 and more importantly, 2024, how it is that they handle this increase in order book, which is a, a real, it's a real point of contention with me. Um, some of the analysts tried to get Thomas Healy to speak about this, uh, you know, and, and it came in the form of, look, Thomas, you've got 200 ERX orders. How, how is it that you're going to identify who gets what and when, and when could those, uh, more importantly, when could those deliveries be made? and that revenue uh, recognized. And, and the irony about this discussion is if we're struggling to answer those questions around 200 orders, how is it that we expect to answer these quarters or uh, these answers around, or these questions around 2000 orders? This company needs four to 5,000 orders to break even, okay? How it is that they get there? I don't know at this point, I don't. I know some of the fragmented pieces and foundational um, uh, comments that have, have been made with regard to the cooperation of the OEM, Peter Belt being that lone OEM right now to make that happen. Um, how, how it is that they're going to um, segue these orders uh, and or orders that could come in and maybe not get realized right away because of other obligations for Peterbilt um, is just beyond me at this point. Um, whether or not competition is going to flood the OEMs um, with orders and just drown highly on out. Look, there's only a, a potential of 55,000 orders per year. Where is Hylion going to fit into the mix in that? Um, are they going to get 25% of those orders? Um, Peterbilt's got to turn out 25% by 2025 in accordance with some of the new mandates, but who's to say that Hylion is going to gain um, any percentage of that 25, uh, if any? Um, and what is that number going to be? Um, we're not provided any color at all 
on those relationships thus far. It's just being communicated that um, it's solid and we have a good working relationship with Peter Bilt. I don't know what's in writing. I have no idea. And for something so critical in this um, wave of momentum to ensure that these products get pushed to the customers, which is ultimately the end result, right? Um, you know, right now I've got probably just as many or more questions as to the future of Hylian. I'm very excited about where they've come and what they've been able to do up to this point. But the questions going forward when, uh, no pun intended, the rubber meets the road, um, I, I think some of the analysts this time around, even some that I am very, very diff tough on, um, uh, Stephen Fisher and Mark Delaney, I've been pretty hard on, on both of those guys. Um, their questions this time during the Q&A were right on point, right on point, uh, especially from some of the other analysts as well, from JP Morgan, as well as, uh, as Cantor Fitzgerald, with it, which is, they're all analysts on the company. And in all fairness to them, they've got to be provided uh, metrics on where this company is going. And I, I dare to ask the deeper question, does Hylion really know? Um, you know, are, are they really relying on this ride and drive that seems to have been kind of a made up thing since the stock has gone public as being the catalyst, not to use Thomas Healy's words indirectly, rather directly, but the very catalyst that has driven um, the sales that have been garnered up to this point. Um, I, I, I beg to point you back to um, the original investor presentation, and I, I posted this week on Twitter, I was kind of at the end of my rope with regard to what actually went into the original projections to suggest that there was going to be such an interest in the marketplace to, to garner 4,500 um, hybrid orders and, and 1,500 or 2,500 uh, hyper truck ERXs in 2022. Guys, we're, we're at zero. If you compare those numbers, I mean, 200 uh, ERX orders right now is anemic. So what was the information that they looked at on the onset? And a lot of people will say, well, that doesn't matter, Ryan, it doesn't matter. I don't do the independent investor channel to try to tell people what it is that they want to hear. I try to do the independent investor channel to try to tell people what they need to hear. And I know institutions have all the time in the world to just sit on this name and maybe it works out and maybe it doesn't. There has been a massive transitional shift in the share ownership, if you guys haven't uh, noticed, and retail investors um, that feel like me and are being uh, succumbed to the pressure of relinquishing shares. Because if you look out there on the landscape with regard to the analyst covering this company, it's, it's all negative, all of it. Um, there's nothing positive that I'm going to talk about here. And it's one of the main reasons why my conviction stays so steadfast in that we may look at this opportunity now in 2022 and suggest maybe that, okay, they haven't met projections as I have so elegantly laid out in their original uh, forecast. But what is that going to mean in a year? What is that going to mean in two years? What is that going to mean in five years for this company when we look back and we look at the interest that's been garnered over the product and having no way whatsoever that we could forecast what type of snowball effect that interest in the product is going to create via demand over the forthcoming years and months. And I want to split this up into two different categories, okay? Over the short term, which I consider to be to the end of 2023, that is what I consider to be the short term with this company. And my friends, for those of you guys that tune into me every single year, every single week, and have tuned into me for years and respect my opinion over the short term until 2023, it is anybody's guess as to where this company goes. Some are calling it to be flatlined. Some of it are considering that it revisits the lows. Some are considering it to have, be a slow drift north, um, which is more of the camp that I am in because it's... Um, probably a lot more imaginative in thought to presume that Hylion is not going to incur um, more orders 
And there's some reasons that I'm going to discuss, which are fact-based to allow me to project along that trajectory for the company, which is uh, probably the reason why I would suggest that remaining so low on these, these, the current stock price is probably a lot less likely going forward as we march toward an inevitable positive catalyst for the company, um, then the company drifting further without attracting some level of buying interest. In other words, I think that the company stock price specifically in relation to what the company is doing right now has based, and it's been basing for a long, long time. The, the, the latest retraction in the stock price, I think, is justified. Um, Hylion cannot come out and just miss revenue numbers by 59% and expect to have a positive reaction um, in the marketplace. I think the after hours sell-off and then the quick recovery speaks to a company that is really just bouncing along the bedrock as far as I'm concerned. So my concern isn't necessarily that we incur more downturn from here. I think the exacerbated downturn is probably is probably behind us. Um, I say that tongue in cheek. This company has done nothing but prove everybody wrong. Um, it has made nobody money, and it has done nothing but lose shareholders. Uh, not only money, the money piece for the advanced investment is something that uh, all investors can can understand. Um, it, it's really just the um, lack of confidence. And I know there's people out there. There's going to be people who say, oh, "I have full confidence." Really? Do you truly? Um, you know, it's a mix of what was promised on the onset and the mix of looking at what is being projected now. And if I could just put full confidence in understanding that, you know, even Sherry Baker, man, I listened very intently to her explanation of meeting the sales targets for 2022 in between two and three million. And I wasn't confident. Mm -mm. I was not confident by her tone. I wasn't. Um, nothing would surprise me. Nothing would surprise me more than the backlog not materializing, um, highly on not being able to pursue this small hybrid pipe dream that they have of installing hybrid units on new trucks, and that they miss revenue projections or at least come in on the low side. Now, the reason why I say that, this is my opinion, this is why you guys would tune into me because it's worth revolving around whether or not they meet the two to three uh, uh, million in projected revenue for 2022 is that they were pressed on this fact and they fumbled around the answer like no tomorrow because there has to be so many pieces that fall into place to ensure that they meet that uh, two to three. The question is simple. Are you going to fall in, on the low end or the, or the high end? And basically the answer was, I don't know. Now they reaffirmed guidance and people who are just naive bear, uh, bulls on the company are going to say, well, th they reaffirmed guidance to two to three million. Um, and, and I would also suggest perhaps maybe that that would be the first time that Hylion sets themselves up for failure in the future, right? To not meet a projected time frame or a, or a projected revenue um, um, guidance, hmm. you know, kind of makes you think a little bit, guys. Uh, I Nobody's talking about the fact that maybe they blow that number out of the water. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. which I think if they were doing things smartly right now, when nothing else matters, uh, put a number out there from two to 3 million and then deliver six. They're both anemic, three, six, 10 million. None of it matters. None of it matters. But if you blow open projections that you've doubled and tripled down on two, three quarters in a row for 2022 and you blow it out of the water, that's a catalyst for the stock. Nobody's talked about it. Why? Because there's really been no inclination at all that there hasn't been a stone that's left unturned. Uh, I think Healy does have um, the canny ability to strategically think along those fronts. In other words, Honest Thomas um, in the marketplace is probably going to realize very, very quickly that there's a little bit of gamesmanship to be played with regard to not playing all of his cards all at once. And I'm hoping that this comes to fruition in the coming quarters. What do I mean by that? 
The backlog of 1.5 million in hybrid would have me to believe that there are more interested customers out there than we are Prevy to. Furthermore, it would suggest that there is massive interest in the product uh, and that interest should grow. Where interest grows and the hybrids are able to be installed at a more accelerated pace over the next coming short term, I've defined that to you guys all through 2023 as the hyper truck is going through its fleet trials and, and validation and certification, et cetera. Um, the hybrid sales are going to continue to be that bottom line sales catalyst that at least drives that revenue um, from quarter to quarter. Now, mind you, anything less than you know 10 million of revenue over the next coming quarters is going to be um, is going to be ridiculous. It's not even going to cover their cost of R and D, right? So we know that the company has to garner massive interest from the Hypertruck ERX to even make it. But the, the, the telling piece for me really is their ability to come into a Q3 and actually look to surprise. Because here's the thing, shareholders are getting somewhat tired of entering into every single quarter and knowing carte blanche that we're going to have to put lipstick on the quarter and shape it up to be something other than catastrophic. Um, I used the term neutral, but there were a few things that were catastrophic with this company. Okay. And I know there's going to be, again, those bulls out there. And I, I have a uh, responsibility from week to week to try to thread the needle between what I really want to say. And I tell you what, that would probably be the most riveting uh, social media content if I could just come on and say what I want to say most of the time. But I try to be as neutral as I can, because anytime you allow emotion to take charge of your, your dialogue, um, people may not see it your way. They might not be as emotionally connected to an opportunity as you are. They may just not really want to hear what you have to say if it's emotionally charged. Rather stick with the close to the vest type of opportunity that we have here, okay? So when I suggest that missing revenue projections by 59%, is, is somehow a neutral type of, 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 of application to the quarter, um, I, I'm, being, I'm being generous mm -hmm, mm -hmm, because that's pathetic, all right? But just as a segue and a side note, I'm covering a company right now, and I, I, I compare sometimes the companies. I deal with CEOs every single week on the Independent Investor Channel. Um, I, too, have plenty of gamesmanship, and it was something that I wish I could just give Thomas Healy as a page out of my playbook, because for what you guys see on the Independent Investor Channel with my live stream on Friday and my Sunday video on Hylion, I, I love these products, but these are the tip of the iceberg. They really are. And if you don't think for a second that a guy like myself is not building something below the surface, um, you're crazy. Um, I want people to believe that they're part of something very special here um, in the community, and they are. But my interactions on a weekly basis with many, many CEOs and many, many companies out there help me derive kind of a well-rounded perspective when I look to evaluate a company like Hylion that is valued right now at $700 million. They've given away Oh, 60, 60 or so million in market cap just this week on the downtrend. It was down every day, um, it exacerbated sell-off with the market volatility. And I, I'm going to talk about that too. I don't think that's a headwind that necessarily helps Ileon right now. I think market sentiment is absolutely horrible. But uh, when, when you talk about when you talk about comparing what it is that Hylion is doing, they've received some scrutiny on the salaries that they garner. Um, and I look at other companies that took cost cutting methods. The one company that I'm covering right now, you guys have never heard of, it is a penny stock. It's trading for less than two cents a share. And you guys are going to enjoy this. Actually, the large share owners are not going to enjoy this at all. Um, they're going to hate me for it. Um, that's totally fine. Business is business. And here's the comparison. Company Parcel Pals that I am covering right now generated $2.7 million in top-end revenue 
uh, just last quarter, Q1 of 2022, $2.7 million. <sighs> Hylion is projecting in between two and $3 million of revenue for the entire FN year. Parcel Pals is valued at a market cap of $15 million. $15 million. Hylion is valued at $700 million. It's not a fair comparison, Ryan. You can't do that. Really? Um, is the $2.7 million of top-end revenue that Parcel Pals was able to garner in, um, in Chuck E. Cheese tokens? No, it wasn't. Um, that was uh, top-end revenue in CAD, which is an <laughs> uh, internationally recognized currency. Mm -hmm. 2.7. And you might think, well, that was a one-off. No, it wasn't. Q4 of 2021, they garnered $3.1 million of revenue for the quarter. This is a shipping and logistics company hustling, okay, doing their deed through acquisitions. <clears throat> they just garnered two acquisitions this year and are penetrating the North American market for the first time in the U.S., they predominantly do uh, uh, their business in Toronto, Calgary, and uh, one other uh, Canadian um, uh, city and are, have just penetrated the West Coast here. They are looking to turn an EBITDA profit in between Q3 and Q4 of this year. For the first time in the company's history, the company has been public for two years. Well, they're completely different scenarios, Ryan. Really? Is it so different to suggest perhaps maybe that some of the talking heads that value Hylion or are trying to value Hylion and trying to press Thomas Healy on these numbers that need to be disclosed with regard to MSRP? I mean, how fair are you being to shareholders? He said quickly that he has to be fair to shareholders with regard to the release of the MSRP data. So to suggest that we cannot release that data, which leaves Cantorf and J Fitzgerald uh, confused as to what to project into the future with regard to what these sales numbers are even going to shake out. So unknowing in the stock market is just as much as bad news. Therefore, the stock gets downgraded and the stock digresses. Okay, Whether or not it was directly or indirectly related to the downgrade from Cantor is beyond me. I don't know, and I don't presume to know. I don't care to know. The question, and the deeper question is, does Hylion have some work to do with providing more transparency to the marketplace? I've said this throughout the course of, and I would suggest that they do, um, and I believe that they will, uh, but I believe that, you know, when is that going to be? When is that going to be? I just think that <clears throat> there's an awful, I have an awful hard time in sitting back sometimes and asking, does Hylion really know this stuff? Or do they just not know this stuff? And they cannot, they cannot address this to the grander marketplace out there, right? Back to the debt reduction. Parcel Pals, the company that I've covered, had about 1.1 million in debt. And they took and they reduced that debt from quarter to quarter by 74%. The company stands to be debt-free. It's down to 300000 of debt on the books. Both the company CEO and the company executives agreed to an incentive-based freeze from the company. So a little bit of fiscal stewardship. I don't see any of that from Hylion. I don't see any type of sense of urgency. I don't see any type of, what if we have a prolonged volatile market going forward? What if we enter into 2024 and Hylion has 10,000 order back deposits, but they can only deliver upon 400 of them because of availability of the OEM. It's going to create what I'm going to talk about here in the cons category when I get done talking about what it is that I think is so bullish about this company going forward. So on a cross comparison, the, the scrutiny is very, very real. Now, what does it mean for my bullish shareholder position, right? For you guys that know, and for full disclosure, I own 12,200 shares of the company. And I had a Twitter feed come through and say, yeah, this scrutiny is great, Ryan, but you're not going to sell your shares. You're right. 
you're right. My video through the independent investor channel has nothing to do with where my dollars are pledged for the opportunity over the next five years, which I put more into the medium term category with this company, not short term, not long term. I put it into the medium term category five years out because guys, I think that that's what, what it's going to take at this point. And if you say, well, it's unfair to have to adjust your time and uh, expectations. If that's what it takes, then that's exactly what we're going to do. Now, bullish shareholders are like, yeah, that's right, Ryan. That's exactly what needs to happen. It doesn't matter what's been projected in the past. Um, it doesn't matter insofar as the past is the past. It does matter in putting a little bit of charge back to Hylion to gain back a little credibility with regard to what they project and what they can actually follow along with some level of certainty into the future. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really just, it's like that. It, it's, um, you know, how long can you chip away from investor confidence before you lose investor confidence altogether? And they've lost a ton of it. They really have. And I think it's the institutions, man, they identify with this opportunity and they are picking up shares like no tomorrow. Heavy, heavy buying interest. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about it. I'm one of the very, very few. I, I had Sober Trades give me a shout out. I really appreciate that. Sober Trades, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. He's had some very, very kind words. But, but here's the thing. This is the only thing that, that feels right for me to do this because nobody is seeing this opportunity for what it is. Nobody. And if you sit back and say, is this a good idea? That's where I'd like to start the debate. If you would suggest and want to be a bear on this highly on opportunity, I'd like you to debate me on the idea itself. Is the idea bad and why? Okay. So let's talk about some of the things that I've identified here to keep in mind as a share owner. This is who I speak to every single week. If you guys tune into the independent investor channel for my weekly commentary and you do not own shares in highly on Please understand that you're going to get it from a perspective of a share owner in the company and, and, and one that is trying to further the dialogue from week to week on this company, all right? 200 ERX orders is a big deal, all right? These are orders that have come from private companies. These have come from network companies like AMG, companies that really the 250 has fallen off the radar. And I think those orders are going to come to fruition. I do. Uh, we haven't got any uh, solidified and confirmed orders from A and G, but it's in their best interest. They're in the network of fueling with Hylion. And I think it's one of the big pieces of the fabric that actually undertone uh, where it is. I think this opportunity comes together because there are so many different moving parts in this thing. When I compare a, a, you know, a, a two cent company to Hylion that's trading at about $4 a share, the market cap's so incredibly huge. There's a reason for that. Okay, because the the market potential for Hylian is so much larger, therefore it garners that higher market capitalization capitalization in that the opportunity that they're going after is worth hundreds of millions, and dare I say billions of dollars of revenue. Whereas a, a, a sh small shipping and logistics company is probably going to meet market saturation at some point. Realize what it is that they can do on their churn realize what it is that they can do in way of competition that really separates those two. So I don't mean to compare the two as being in the same arena. I just compare the two basically looking at how much, you know, scrutiny we put on two to 3 million from Hylion and me, I'm like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Look, the only thing that matters is all of the stuff that we talk about the company doing and has not done yet. That's the only thing that matters with Hylion. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, I know Rick is a, a, an advocate of, of Hylion and um, one of the main uh, administrators within the Discord group. So I'll take this opportunity to segue a shout out for the Discord group. I know the group is growing every single week, and that is great. It is the best source on this earth for public forum public discussion on this company. We need to have as many bodies in there as we can, as long as you can earn the recommendation to stay in that, okay? You can't go in there and act a fool. Um, you'll, you'll get kicked out, but I would like to put my plug in there uh, for the highly on Discord group, because I tell you what, when this thing does take off, uh, that's going to be the spot to be for the party. You're going to want to be on the inside, not the outside. So uh, get your ticket now. It's free of charge, because once this thing takes off, I, I really wouldn't 
I, it wouldn't surprise me a bit if those guys actually monetized that, that discord group. It's a great idea because the information is invaluable and nothing is free anymore, except for the information that you get from my channel, from sober trades, the wall street engineer, who also does a fabulous, uh, great job. Um, Helion, um, Helion, right. Is the name of the channel. I try to shot out as many as I can. Um, I don't really appreciate the regurgitation of the Q and a sessions guys. That's just an indication that you want to grow your channel. If you care enough about this highly an opportunity, please just offer your commentary. Like I do just come on and talk to people. All right. I don't need to have the Q and a uh, regurgitated for me for so you can build your channel on the back of Hylion. All right. If you're that passionate about it, follow my lead because I'm the leader in this space. Me, I am. Okay. There's been others that have come and they've gone and they've gone silent on the line. They don't want to talk about it anymore. That's totally fine. I'll continue to forge uh, forward. I'll continue to be the pointy end of the spear on this topic because I know at some point it's going to absolutely pay off. There's just no doubt in my mind. And now is the time where we need to be having the discussion right now. So 200 ERX orders. The question is, what is that order book going to be looked at when we enter into 2024, latter part of 2023, when they're looking to identify those build slots on who is going to get their trucks delivered first? In other words, if we have a backlog of, let's say, 10,000, <laughs> Oh my goodness, Ryan. Yeah, 10,000. Um, just say 25,000. It doesn't matter. They have to have a much more robust uh, order backlog because at that point, winter validation will be done. Carb certification uh, will be achieved. Uh, and we would uh, suggest that perhaps maybe this ride and drive that they ha are so accustomed to running down there in Austin generates a lot more churn as well as some organic churn within the industry to say, hey, Hylion, you got to look at these guys. These guys have a solution that absolutely works on the bottom line. It absolutely is one that can deliver on that TCO. Give them a shot. Let them sit across for the table from you and sell you on their opportunity. They won't have to sell you on anything, man. Their product just, it, it works. It's great. So uh, the 200 orders, that's going to be huge in growing and emboldening over the short term, guys. I said this was a bridging phase from last quarter, two quarters ago to account for Q, uh, Q3, Q4 into 2023 and Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 of 2023. That's just where we are. We're in a bridging phase. That's, it's just as simple as that. What happens over the coming uh, quarters? Let's just call it six quarters. I, I, I'm, I'm not here to promise you one thing or another, okay? We're, we're all adults here. This is business. You have to make your own decisions with regard to where your loyalty lies with this company and to what extent. I, I've got a lot of people that are like, yeah, I hate the company. I bought 500 shares at $48 a share, and now I hate the company, and I'm going to trash the company. Look, if you entered into the company at $48, man, I will suggest perhaps maybe, and I'll be above board with this, that you had a piece of bad luck. Okay, you had a piece of bad luck in the stock market. Nobody cares about your luck. Nobody cares about your emotion. Nobody cares about the losses on the book that you have. Nobody cares. The only thing that matters is the future potential. It's the only thing that matters on an opportunity like this. Now, when we get into the 2000 reservations, it's definitely a pro. It shows massive interest amongst private companies, public companies, as well as from the sampling of the Hypertruck ERX Innovation Council, which we still don't have 100% representation uh, from on the Innovation Council, which is exciting enough. I expect those orders to be forthcoming. Uh, and I think the upper management would agree that some of those companies like Anheuser-Busch, I'm interested to see what they do on this opportunity. And I think they're waiting. I, if I was a big company, I wouldn't do what Rwan did. did. I wouldn't place my orders early. Why? Well, what is the point to that? There's going to be a little bit of critical mass here in that if there's priority that's proven out to the original uh, deposits uh, to secure those build slots, that you actually get your hyper truck earlier than later. Now that's the incentive enough. And I'm quite certain that the sales team are talking about, you know, where they are in the queue of order backlogs. And in other words, if you place your order earlier, you're going to get your truck first. And I think it could be that separator on when we hit that shift, because right now we haven't hit the shift. 
until we really start seeing a massive inflow of over the road electrification, we are not going to be in that arena of transition. Right now, we are dominated by diesel. That's the landscape, okay? You can like it or not. I, I don't care. Um, I don't deliver what it is that you want to hear. I deliver what it is that you need to hear. And what you need to hear is electrification is in the first inning, the first, not, not even second, third, and certainly not the ninth, okay? So... When we look at this opportunity unfolding, it is slowly unfolding right before our eyes right now in the first inning, trying to get fleets to understand the benefit of the electrified future as opposed to being reliant upon a diesel dominated future and, and present. And at present right now, we are still dominated by diesel, okay? We're still dominated. So the 2000 reservations um, is key. We'll continue to need to embolden that. They were they were pressed on that, whether or not they could transition some of those reservations over. Um, and I, it was wishy washy on the answer. I didn't I didn't know. I I would really like to see Thomas Healy be provided because I think he's in a tough spot. I really do. I think Thomas does not want to speak in the way that he wants to speak because he has provided. Um, projections in the past that have not come to fruition so to sit back and 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 say be really close to the vest with regard to the analyst um, commentary uh, on the earnings call is probably what he wants to do right now uh, but I think going forward once this company really starts to get these orders rolling in in numbers that are respectable uh, I think you're going to find that Thomas Healy and Sherry probably speak much more from a position of confidence um, than trying to be really close to the vest because this company right now, um, it is vulnerable and it's got to thread the needle and it's got to surgically do this. And um, I wish I saw more sense of urgency. Uh, I Let me just believe, and I typically do not um, invest on faith. Um, I've done it with this company. I've broken all my rules on this company. Uh, it is the investment of a lifetime, whether or not it works out or not. I don't know, but I got a long road to hoe. Um, over the short term, it'll be probably the most volatile time with this company. When I get this company above 10, 12, 15, 20 bucks, um, it's going to be easy. Um, it'll be easy to own the company. It'll be a lot easier than watching it go down every single day for years after years after years. Uh, and it will be that turning point of covering the company when it was so anemic. And we talked about 200 ERX orders and 200 reservations as somehow being a positive of the company because we were so hungry for positive information that when these orders are coming in in rogues and if, if they achieve that end, which is where we're going. Look, Hylion doesn't even talk about this anymore. They talk about these this 200 and 2000 as if it's going to somehow be the shining star into the future. No, I just think it's a it's a it's a it's an opportunity to suggest on a very minute scale what could be potentially uh, garnered in the future uh, with regard to orders and reservations. All right. And the 1.5 million backlog, it is indeed a positive uh, to show that there is interest in the hybrid product. Um, you know, every quarter seems to deliver a whole new twist of discussion points and uh, understanding of where we think it could mean when we could realize these orders. Um, this was the piece of comeback on the call that I didn't really enjoy too much from Sherry, other than the fact that she's reaffirming from two to 3 million on a startup company like this, um, they can miss and, and be given a very, very long leash. But, um, I just wasn't put at, at ease at all that they're going to be in between the range of two to 3 million. And I, I quite frankly believe that this company needs a break. It really does. I, I think if they turned out five and a half million for 2022, I think that would be a monumental, a monumental achievement for this company showing that yes, indeed, there is interest in the marketplace because if nothing else, Thomas Healy has tried to sell a story that industry is overwhelmingly interested in going to electrification. And if you would suggest that 200 and 2000 and 1.5 million in backlog in a $1 trillion industry is overwhelmingly interested, uh, I would beg to differ because right now this just doesn't hold muster. It does not, it doesn't even keep the lights on guys. 
let's be real. Um, it certainly doesn't pay their upper management their salaries. You know? Well, think about that for a second. I mean, this, this company is on a plane right now with the promise of doing something great. Will they? I don't know. In the interim, they're making huge, huge salaries. And are they earning it? Well, some people would say this is a sensitive topic, Ryan. You can't touch this stuff. I don't know. There's companies out there that are making more money than highly on quarter over quarter, and they don't take executive compensation because you have to earn it. You're a publicly traded company. And I, I personally, this is a big thorn in my side. I don't believe that those folks should be taking such huge salaries right now. I don't. I think it's horrible. Now, it just sets themselves up for more scrutiny in the, in the future. If they cannot deliver on the promises, deliver on the promises, earn that money. You're just, you're just being paid out of SPAC dollars that yes, is a, is a positive when we look at this company's balance sheet. But you know, when you're talking about an educational series of videos that come out and where are they getting that money from? Is that part of the R and D budget that we paid for as SPAC dollars that, that publicly funded this company to come and teach people about EV. There was nothing but positive on that thread. Nothing but positive. Me, I look at it differently. And there's some that share in my sentiment. I don't think we need that right now. I think you're wasting your time. We need to embolden the, the order book and reservation and do everything we can do to move toward that CARB NHTSA certification, the winter validation. Everything that needs to be done right now is not being done. We, we want to just take this educational perspective. You're a publicly traded company to drive top and bottom line revenues and profits. That's your job. Your job is not to become an instructor. You know? It's just my opinion. The reviews on the company have been overwhelmingly positive, and it's something that we come back to. The CEOs, the executives of the companies, the drivers that are actually experiencing the orders that have been forthcoming after the ride and drive, nothing short of positive, okay? And when we look at, do I invest in this company or not, Ryan? Can you just tell me the bottom line, all the hoopla and blah, blah, and back and forth and you know, comparing two cent stocks to it? Should I buy the company or not? comes down to this very simple, simple statement. Do you believe that the product is revolution, revolutionary enough to drive that TCO that by Thomas Healy's admission fleets are looking for? The answer is yes. You wonder why I'm so bullish on the company? It's because everything fundamentally that I've looked at has given me every indication that this is a phenomenal investment. Whether or not that happens tomorrow or within the short term, or medium term or long term is yet to be determined. I don't speak along those lines. Uh, I've been doing stock market investing my whole life, and it just drives me up the wall when people come on and they perceive to know everything about what a stock chart does and exactly when a stock is going to turn south, when it's going to go up, and when and how it's going to do it. And it's exactly going to behave in the exact way that they say it's going to behave. <laughs> I don't believe in any of that. And the quicker retail investors can come to that very fact, that investing is an educated guess. It's an educated guess. And if you'd like to take your educated guess on Johnson & Johnson that gives you 110 years of data to draw from, go ahead. Your upside potential is going to be reflective of the level of risk that you are willing to take. When you look at a company like Hylion, your data that's been provided thus far with regard to their introduction to the marketplace has been garnered over the last couple of years. And if you want to go back to the inception of the company, go back to 2015. You can. It was a disaster then. <laughs> you know, uh, Thomas Healy had some grand ideas about you know putting the hybrid on the trailer itself rather than on the tractor. Um, the company's evolved to where it is now. The, the question is, what do we know over the last couple of years would have you suggest that they're not going to be in a better place two years from now, or even in the short term? I'm looking at the next six, six quarters, which is you know, 16 months, I guess, on the countdown to getting into back half of 2023. That's where I think things are going to get interesting from a shareholder perspective. I look at 2024 as being just the beginning the beginning of a new phase with this company. So the day-to-day -day impatience from stock owners and retail investors alike now in 2022 are futile. 
they are futile. And I don't care if they come from me or you or anybody else out there, they're futile. And if you don't like it enough to hold the company and be pissed off about it, sell your stock, sell your stock if you don't like it. When it comes right down to it, that's the bottom line. You can be upset, you can be irritated, you can be naive. I'm, I'm, I sometimes cringe about some of those highly on holders out there that will not scrutinize the company at all. Uh, Silent Alert is the only one, and he does it better than me. He does it better than me. He's a great, great source of information. He's part of the Discord community and one of many great resources out there. And he does a better job than me. He's much more above board. I'm much more scathing. Um, he does a great job of elegantly putting that scrutiny out there to be like, you know, come on, man. Come on. There are questions out there, man. Is it really so much to, to, to suggest that, yes, okay, the question is out there, but I cannot answer that question because of this, this, and this. But it's not like that. Uh, me personally, I'm ignored. He's been responded to one time, and he's one of the biggest advocates on Twitter for Hylion. And, you know, and these are just the small pockets of information that if you're not following Silent Alert, man, you want to follow the guy. He's great, very elegant, always on top of information. I find myself looking at Twitter to make sure that there's no updates coming from Silent Alert. I, I thank you very much, man. Those efforts that you put forward, man, they do not go unnoticed. They don't. And I, for one, appreciate it big time. I think it's great. Um, I was a little scathing over Twitter this week. I, I, I get it. But the frustration on really being forthcoming with shareholders, man, I am not the only one. I am not the only one who feels this way. And I think over time, once given a little bit of validation behind the scenes, because I think there's so many unknowns right now, I think Thomas Healy will do the right thing. I really do. I, I think I think once given that validation, because right now it's kind of in the test tube phase a little bit, it really is um, much more than I would have been confident in investing this much on the onset on uh, having known it. Uh, but I was, you know, kind of pulled into the opportunity based on the projections. And um, that just that's my own personal lesson. And if you guys want to know what that personal lesson is, it's to take everything um, that's provided over the public marketplace, even if it is submitted to the SEC, um, as utter and complete bullshit on the onset. It is. Um, if you can lie, scheme, and manipulate nowadays and just fudge your numbers and put something out there that's elegant and acceptable to the SEC, no problem. You'll make it. Um, honest folks like myself, I don't see how that's even possible, but that's what happened. Whatever information that went into those original projections, good on you for drafting those. And I'm quite certain that Vince Cubbage uh, is riding off into the sunset with his millions of dollars with his neon green parachute um, made possible on the backs of many, many investors on the onset that took a lot of that information at face value. That's where the lesson uh, it comes in for me. You think I'll do this again? you're crazy. You're crazy. I will invest in Johnson and Johnson and Home Depot for the rest of my life, because that my friends is the tried and true uh, path to wealth. I was asked on the live stream, you know, what are you, are you invested back in nickel again? Uh, yeah, I took a small position this week on the, on the downturn. It really got whacked from its high of $9 a share. It's now down to six. I entered into some long contracts on nickel and it was like, well, does that mean I'm less of a highly on investor? I'm opportunistic. This is about money. This isn't about anything other than that. This is about money. It's not about the, you know, the, 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 the ego. It's not about that. It's about looking at opportunity in an industry where I think there is early inning opportunity in. It's just that simple. And, you know, the bear bait uh, debate that was put out, I think, over Paul's channel that talked about Nicola being ahead of, of Hylion, they are, but they've taken a... a significantly different route in this whole deal. Um, and I think both of them are going to succeed. Uh, I think both of them have a lot of work to do. Oh, my goodness. And I was asked, you know, what do you think about this? And I said, you know, we get so wrapped up in the back and forth on, on both of these companies. And, you know, I hate these, this camp because they invest in here and they hate me because I invest in this and blah, blah, and yippity hoo da and dippity day. And, and it's just like, none of it matters. They're both speculative investments. And quite frankly, if you want my honest opinion, they're both shitty investments. If you look at the fundamentals of both companies, speculative, which means we're investing in the future potential of the company. You want to look at fundamentals? 
you want me to do a bare breakdown fundamental of Hylion? You, you don't. You don't want me to do that. I've done it before and I get a lot of scrutiny for it. I get a lot of scrutiny for it. It's like, let's demote this guy because he doesn't see it eye to eye with us in that Hylion is just going to sell, you know, hundreds of thousands of units into the future. And they're going to, you know, get to that two, three, five, ten billion $10 billion in revenue and 20 and $30 billion market cap in the industrial sector uh, with no problem. Um, prove it, prove it. They've got a lot of work to do, man. And I believe that they will. I believe that they will probably end up in a place that will not be forecastable at this point in the evolution of this young company. I think they'll get there, but I think it's going to be a long and winding road. And I certainly don't believe that they're just going to get there uh, and, and, and all the companies are just going to roll over and there's not going to be competition. And Peter Bilt is just going to say, sure, Hylion, you can take half of our build slots and just build your business. Um, is there a potential for Cummins just to come in and end this project altogether for the independent investor? Yeah, yeah. Be quite honest with you, I'd be damn relieved. I already own shares of Cummins. I, I'll own a bigger share of Cummins if they take over highly on and probably have much more success in seeing the Hypertruck ERX on the on the road, knowing that they have the actual financial backing of a company like Cummins that's tried, true, established, and 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 absolutely a worldwide brand. Nobody knows about this company. That's part of the side niche amongst many that I put this message out there. And I know that's the intent of why Healy is putting out his educational videos, but I'm like, damn, why? Are you kidding me? Is, is the 3000 people that you're getting to view your content on YouTube really that worth it? You know, another solicitation went to Hylion to come on to the independent investor channel and do an interview with me. All right. It would be absolutely epic. There would be absolutely the most phenomenal questions asked of you, okay, from me, because I thought the best interview that was done on Hylion of Thomas Ely um, was by um, What the Truck with Dooner. I thought that was the best interview. But I even thought Dooner kind of came across as, hey, this is just another trucker. And I didn't really get the sense that maybe he is a shareholder, maybe he's not. I don't want to presume one way or the other where his loyalty lie with regard to his own personal financial decisions. But that was the uh, that was the, the the tone and tenor of the interview. It was like, hey, Thomas, what's going on, man? Yeah, here, here this, hey, I've got this and this and that. It was a phenomenal interview because of that fact. But it wasn't uh, what I would deliver. Mm-mm-mm. No, 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 no. We're going to be asking about durability of the product over the long term and how they uh, expect to enter into a seven-year minimum of TCO uh, give back for the companies and what data they have to provide uh, any type of reliability matrix on whether or not they can meet this thousand mile of projected range on their Hypertruck ERX, uh, what type of timeframes we're looking at, and why and how aggressively they're pursuing the hydrogen fuel cell end, um, which is uh, of interest to me, um, the agnostic opportunity that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be riveting, but the uh, another invite was uh, suggested. I don't do it anymore. I don't request it on my own behalf. I am very, very sour on this topic. I do this independently, which is, Kind of cool. It's kind of within my wheelhouse. Um, I only do business when I am solicited to do business. And um, outside of Hylion, I'm compensated for my time. This is the only thing that I do free of charge for Hylion, uh, for any company, actually, for that matter. I don't do it for anybody else. I'm compensated for my other ventures and I'm compensated well. So uh, I do this on my own accord and I hope it's appreciated by at least the viewing audience that. Uh, goes through my commentary once a week. All right. Um, the collaboration with Cummins, that's a huge, huge catalyst. And <clears throat> independently, when we talk about these catalysts, doesn't quite tell the whole picture. But when you look at the highly on opportunity, and I'll make sure and, and envision a future where these things really come together, they come together in a big way. And it checks the boxes for all of these large fleets looking to potentially put an order forward when they know that under the hood, there's a Cummins generator, right? When they know that there's a Cummins <laughs> E-axle now, previously Meritor, um, that they know that these components are being sourced and then they can understand a little bit more about the hybrid, the uh, uh, highly on technology cell, which I think is probably one of the most understated 
above the driver experience in the highly on opportunity so far that's been explained over the last two years. Um, if Thomas Healy wants to educate the public, do it on sheerly the onboard uh, technology and the driver display metrics. That's something that I've seen fragments of um, through the course of the last two years. That would be something that I could get behind and support because that is really the proprietary software that you guys are looking to sell, right? That is the algorithmic type of data extrapolation that you're looking to take off of the trucks, process the data, either on board or in the cloud to do some of those um, uh, pr pr um, uh, those um, uh, projected maintenances, right? Uh, some of those um, some of those things that can be projected to be needed and, and assist fleets in the logistics portion of their business. That's something that never gets talked about. And I think it's a huge, huge catalyst going forward. I think it's going to come to the forefront when this highly an opportunity really does get a lot of light shed on it. And we have more articles that come out through online um, than just uh, it, it's it's a terrible company and it's valued at $2 a share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, hit jobs, hit jobs being hired on, just like I'm hired on to do profiles on companies, man. These hit jobs are hired on to do blog articles on how, how bad the company is. And they don't know two squats about the company. And they want a foregone expert about it. I'm, I'm right there at the top. I guarantee I'm top 10. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. You know, and these folks are hired on, man, to do hit jobs on this company. So the institutions can rotate into cheaper shares. That is what is going on, man. You don't believe me? You believe what you want. Uh, I believe what I want talked about the concept as being that answer to why it is we invest in highly on or not. I think the concept of taking an existing truck and electrifying the powertrain is really the, the most bullish aspect of this whole highly on opportunity that we can ever draw up. And it is one of the most bullish concepts. And all the other stuff we talk about, we get a little bit heated down below the surface and driving a, a little bit about, you know, this and that and executive compensation and pushed timelines to the right and blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, are you investing in the concept? And it's the concept that I really love and get behind on this company. The driver experience, I talked about that. We've got you know positives that have come through on that front. The technology we've talked about, um, the leadership. I think the upper management and the executive team, as well as the uh, board of directors is a bullish sentiment around Hylion. I think it's fabulous. I, I think it's going to be one of those key components that come together when this company actually does start to materialize some of this stuff as they march toward what they're gonna need to cover CapEx into probably 2025 is where it's going to need to start. I, I have 2025 is really that break-even point uh, for the company, whether or not they're going to be able to churn out, you know, orders on a consistent basis to cover CapEx. Right now, shit, it's anybody's guess. Come on, man. Look, I know the naive people are like, yeah, just invest thousands and thousands of shares, man. Boom, I'm going to buy more. Yeah, I'm going to buy more. I'm going to buy more. Buy more. I haven't, bought, I haven't bought stock in this company for three months. Mm -hmm. The unknowns are very, very real to me. Unknowns are very, very real to me. Um, and until we want to start to ask these difficult questions, which the analyst started to do on the latter portion of the uh, Q&A call this time around, then we're not going to know. Then we are investing in trust. We really are that there are going to be so many orders of Hypertruck ERX come through the pike that they're going to be able to not only grow revenue, but also realize a profit above their CapEx, maybe even expand the business, maybe even take and release that share float that is still out there. That locked up share float is still there. Are we going to reach 2025 and still be talking about orders, let's say in the 500s, which is still not going to make muster with the company? And oh, by the way, uh, we, we're going to ask for more trust uh, until 2030 when we actually look to, to uh, uh, turn a profit in this company? Perhaps. It's all possible. It's all possible. I mean, to hear Thomas and Sherry talk, it seems like they've got it all figured out and everything is okay. And there's no sense of urgency whatsoever. Um, the sales team is kind of doing what they do. And they added 30 orders this time around 30. I think they should be doing 30 a day, in my opinion. Um, they will eventually. A lot of people would say it's premature. That I agree with you. It's premature. But eventually, they're going to be needed to turn out 30, 50, 100 a day uh, during the course of a month. <laughs> I, 
they're going to have to be garnering thousands and thousands of orders per year to make CapEx, to cover the cost of expenses, that of which I have right now at around, let's just call it $150 million a year. It's going to increase over time. And as the order flow grows, it's going to have to get close to actually covering that. Right now, the coverage is like at 1%, 1. We have 99% more top end revenue to earn on this company to make sure that CapEx is, is covered. And people say, well, the, the, the balance sheet is, is solid, Ryan. What are you worried about? That's what I'm worried about. A cash burn at a rate of 130 million and years go by quickly. It's not as if it's just like, oh, we're just going to end up there and everything is going to be hunky dory. No, things need to be urgent now because the clock is ticking. You have to be able to pr prove that you can march along that uh, sustainable order flow and actually be able to cover CapEx. And I have it in the deep, deepest portions of my mind, the worst case scenario on this company, reaching 2025, and they still do not have orders in the amounts of thousands. Yeah, they've turned out some trucks and they're working really, really well in the fleet. But orders are just not coming in at the demand rate that they expected on the onset. And they're garnering 1,000 orders, 500 to 1,000 orders uh, per year instead of four to 5,000, which is what they need. And they're going to fall short hundreds of thousands of dollars on their yearly projections and not be able to meet the top end uh, revenue projections and fail to meet that bottom line profit to, to actually turn a profit by offering this product. Is it possible? I don't know. Like I said, that's the deepest, darkest place. I look at all of the positives on this company that have been put together over the last two years. And if there's anybody that can do it, anybody that can make these catalysts happen, like uh, get, <coughs> excuse me, getting involved with other OEMs out there, other than just Peterbilt, to help supplement that five to four to 5,000 unit per year requirement, that's what needs to happen. Are they doing that right now? Is Kenworth even willing to play ball with Hylian? I don't know. I don't care that your hybrid is agnostic amongst all OEMs. You just suggested that trucks can't be taken out of service for two weeks to even install that hybrid on a used unit. So it absolutely calls into question the opportunity that new installs on hybrids takes because the fleet's not wanting to take their truck out of service to be putting a hybrid unit in it only to have to catch up on that downtime lost hauling freight, right? When we look at the balance sheet, very, very positive. The Innovation Council, very positive. The government mandates that have just come through, the 40,000 credit that got talked about, who knows how that's going to shake out with competition. The 1,000 miles of range and the 75 miles of all EV range, okay? That's what we know right now from a bullish perspective when we look at the highly on opportunity with, with, within a neon green pill, all right? Uh, in my summary. All right. Some of the cons, we've talked about it through the course of this video, the bottleneck effect with the OEM. Um, I need some clarity on whether or not Thomas Healy is so far in bed with Peterbilt to ensure that they're going to be there all the way with Hylion, whether or not they're not just going to bleed it out or do their own piece of business or collaborate in turning out the 15 liter with Cummins uh, off the line to take those build slots away from Hylion. I, I don't know. Could it be such a bottleneck that Hylion is left shivering in the cold out because they don't have enough build slots to actually uh, meet top end projections within their company? They're so reliant on Peterbilt, but they provide so little transparency on what Peterbilt is going to actually mean for their operation going forward, how many build slots they're going to opt them for them, um, how, how much incentive Peterbilt is being provided from Hylion to provide those in the OEM hubs or whatever it is that they are. Right? We haven't heard that for a year. We don't know anything that's happened on that front. The cons, definitely, we talked about the projections from 2020 being so far off base and really kind of taking away from some of the credibility of anything that's being said now. Um, I don't take it. I take it with a grain of salt. I really do now um, when I hear those projections going forward. Um, the OEM reliance, right? How much other OEM help and assistance are they going to need to turn out these numbers? Um, the stock price right now, what can I say? It's horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous. We've improved over the last month. We are up about 7%. We've given back a lot, about 25%. 
of the profit from the highs uh, into the run up to the to the quarter because I think there was some anticipation within the market that Hylion would actually do something other than disappoint. Um, and lo and behold, they disappointed again. So um, great job, Hylion, staying with your uh, continued track record of absolutely obliterating investors. Um, I appreciate the call out for shareholder value, Thomas. I really do. Um, I can appreciate you somehow looking at the MSRP as being somehow sacred and ever-changing and blah, blah, blah. But I don't even think you know. Um, and those are things that you need to know. And when you're pressed by an analyst to provide that information on what you guys are foreseeing with regard to the cost of input of goods, the cost, projected cost of diesel units uh, sold off of the line, which have, yes, by your admission, increased, and what the cost of components, albeit increased over time, what the bottom line MSRP of your product is going to be. That is not that big of a deal of a question to answer on a product that you are looking to sell. And let me suggest this. If you're going to increase shareholder value, eventually you're going to have to sell a product, okay? Eventually you're going to have to come up with a price on what customers are expected to pay for this product going forward. Get it. I mean, what, what are we? Are we, th are we to 2025 before we start even thinking about what we're going to sell this price uh, of this unit going to be? Uh, with inflation going in 2025, the cost of a hypertruck DRX is probably not going to be 279,000. It's going to be, you know, 8 870,000, you know, because we've waited so long and the cost of components have gone up so much. This $40,000 credit, ha, it's going to be a drop in the bucket by the time you come out with some sort of quantifiable metrics that these stock analysts are asking you to provide to them and you are not prepared to provide that information on what type of sales price is going to be associated. And Nicola does. Nicola gives their sales price. We know exactly what their tray, Nicola tray is going to cost. Okay. <laughs> Whether or not uh, fleets are going to pay it, uh, that's a whole nother, a whole nother question. But you at this point should have a better idea, uh, especially a better idea of what you were so comfortable with projecting two years ago on that uh, projection for the sales price being so significantly less than the Tesla, so significantly less than the diesel, so significantly less than the Nikola uh, product put out at 279,000. You're telling me you have less of an idea of what that's gonna cost now? And give me a break, give me a break. Time is definitely working against this company now. The, the, the timeline that I've projected to you guys in this video on short term coming into the latter half of 2023 into 2024 is what I consider the bridge time, the short term on the company. And then something that doesn't get talked about a lot as far as the um, competition goes. Um, I see articles coming out all the time with Cummins and Peterbilt uh, collaborating on um, an all EV future. And you don't want to know what they don't mention is highly on. They don't mention highly on in any of those uh, conversations. If I'm wrong on that, please tell me, but I just don't see it. I see that competition is coming. And right now there is no competition for Hylion as far as I can tell. Is that gonna stay, remain true? If Hylion starts to turn out thousands and thousands of orders, you don't think that there's gonna be others that step forward and say, hell with it, I'm gonna put an onboard generator. I'm gonna build my own software and I'm gonna go into bed with, with Cummins who doesn't acquire Hylion, but has a bunch of different manufacturers below them that provide the same product to the, to the marketplace. Do I think Hylion has a first mover advantage? I do. I do. But is, is theirs and theirs alone to squander? Over the short term, it's going to be a critical time for Hylion to thread the needle on this opportunity and realize the vision that they have so elegantly projected to shareholders and to fleets alike to actually electrify the class eight space. And whether or not they're able to thread that needle, the verdict is out, guys. If you got a sense of frustration from me this week, it is very, very real, and it is very, very alive and well. I am still a share owner in the company, make no mistake about it, and I will continue to be. But this company has got a lot of work to do over the coming short term until the latter portion of 2025, excuse me, 2023. And until then, we're going to continue to hit the drumbeat on this message, make sure we're doing everything that we can possibly do to earmark those sources of good information out there on social media, point out 
those areas that you might not want to just even touch with regard to the blog articles and the hit jobs that are put out on this company. And we're going to live to fight another day, guys. So stay tuned next week. We'll be coming out with another highly on video here, weekly update. Hope you appreciate this. If you enjoy the message, subscribe to the channel. If I've struck up some emotion in you, great. Leave it in the comments below, man. I will respond to you. And if you know anybody out there that's interested in the space in general, share the message with anybody out there that's interested in this EV movement. It is very real. It's not going away this time. We are in the early innings of this opportunity. Make no mistake about it. And there will be a shift in catalyst. And I will be right there for you guys on the precipice to demonstrate for you guys when I think that catalyst and shift away from diesel actually is starting to materialize and the rubber begins to meet the road as we actually realize the potential of this opportunity. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message and good luck in your investment future.